welcome to Reverend Dr. Kim Kaiser. I'm going to try this, see if it works. Does this work? Great. Good morning. Okay, let's, oh, wow. All right. I'll tone down my voice again. So anyway, I've been really enjoying uh, my time up here. So thank you for giving me this opportunity. But it was, uh, where was I? Oh, it was downtown yesterday. They were having that uh, wine tasting and uh, whatever event. You know, we got a chance to really meet uh, Reading, I felt. But it, it reminded me of something. Have you ever been somewhere where someone's calling out? You can't quite tell what the name is. You're not sure. But then it turns out to be you that they're calling for. I felt like this yesterday when I received this statement in my email. And it was given the statement with this question, what will you be looking for? And this is the statement. Today is a pristine day unfolding from the mind of God without impediment, unencumbered by the past. Watch for it and nothing else. And so we begin. I also had the same sense of recognition, somebody calling out to me when, uh, now it's uh, in 2006, I saw this magazine, Time was still in business then, but what it says is the title of my talk. Does God want you to be rich? I checked in to see if whether you'd get the joke up here, and indeed I was told you would, so here we go. Many churches indeed are discussing this question. Uh, the work of Joel Osteen and Joyce Meyer, if you've ever witnessed them, uh, is very much based on this understanding of Christianity that God actually enjoys your abundance. That God is actually quite pleased when you are receiving uh, its largesse. Um, and in this discussion though, if you look at it from the Christian point of view, it often comes out this way. First of all, God is something out there, external to you, which is going to give you something or not. Therefore, God is not only out there, God changes up on you, as they say in modern language. God sometimes gives you what you want, sometimes not. And finally, it says that God somehow sees some kind of value in you having a difficult time. That God's real interest in is finding out, you know, how true, how real, how devoted you are to it. By the way, I don't know, I, you've all been here before, so you probably have heard in this tradition we often speak of God as it, not he or she. Because when we say God, what we're talking about is reality itself. Everything. The one reality. And we say in this tradition that that one reality is intelligent. When I say intelligent, I mean it recognizes you. I speak of this in somewhat, you know, we all have, maybe you've been around a pet, have a pet. And you know there's somebody looking back at you when you look at your pet. That's what I mean by intelligence. So, reality itself is intelligent. And it is, in fact, uh, acting in relationship to us, and we call it it. So, the answer to the question is, in case you were wondering, does God want you to be rich? The answer is no. Okay, well, you want to leave? Anybody want to leave at this point? Okay, why is the answer no? Because... <laughs> uh, it shows what happens when you ask the wrong question. 
God is, in fact, not out there. Reality is not out, out there, and all of reality is there, and you're here. Because God, in fact, is found in the most direct way possible by you turning your attention right now within. Right now, within, God is alive is knowing its world, is feeling its life as you. This is what we mean by God. This place in you right now that's hearing me speak, that is the one mind itself. And we have all called it various things, Kim, Mary, but actually it's one mind and it lives in everyone and it lives in everything in the statement uh, what we believe uh, attributed to Ernest Holmes he says that the innermost God and the highest God are the same this comes out of the teaching of Emerson but it's saying this the most direct route to God, the most direct route to the real is in you right now in every moment. And it's here right now. Now, it's possible to think, well, God's in me, maybe like a raisin's in a bun. You know, there's a little bit of God in me and then there's the bun, the rest of it. And that's not true. God is all there is, including all of you. Everything around you. God can't stand outside of you and do something to you because God is you. God doesn't do anything to you from the outside. It acts through you. And even more, it acts. And when it acts... It looks like you. It can't give you anything else. It can't bring something into being in your life as if it wasn't there before because it's always all of it here right now. But we have these things called the five senses. And the five senses, it's turning out a lot of cognitive neuroscience is showing us these days that our perceptions, our hearing, our sight, our smell, are heavily, heavily influenced by what we think we're hearing, seeing, or smelling. So much so that you will claim with all honesty and authenticity that you have, in fact, seen something actual happen and someone else will report quite differently and it turns out it has to do with our perceptual systems. It has to do with what we think is going on. In Zen Buddhism, they have a very interesting statement. They say, that which comes in through the front gate is not the treasure. The front gate is your five senses. The front gate is what comes in from what seems like it's outside. But, as Zen Buddhism says, that's not the real treasure. The real treasure is within you. The real treasure is alive, already completely present within you. What God wants to give you is that, that awareness. It's already given you what it is. It wants you to be aware of it. God wants to give you the kingdom. Fear not, little flock, Luke 12. For it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Gee, have you experienced it that way? That God itself, reality itself, is attempting to give you something all the time. And we are keeping it out at the front gate. We're using our senses as if they were the way in which God contacts us most directly. 
No, the way God contacts us most directly is when we turn to it. There's a wonderful saying. You all know the story of the prodigal son. The son goes away, spends all of his wealth and inheritance, then comes back. The point I want to make out of that story is that in the Quran, where they tell that same story, the moment the son turns towards home, God comes running. The father comes running. Reality itself. Ernest called it a, Ernest Holmes, the founder of our teaching, he called it a conspiracy. He said, all of nature is conspiring to manifest your freedom so that it may unloose its own energy. So what we have here is a situation where the richness, the wealth, everything we're seeking is already alive within us. And reality itself is continuously wanting to be aware of all that it is in us and as us. It receives pleasure from giving that to us. And so we are asked to be in the kingdom of heaven right now, the consciousness of ever-expanding good. That's a way to talk about heaven. This is the promise we're given through spiritual teachings. The promise is that as you get in tune with what's really going on, you will discover that good in your life is expanding everywhere. You will live in the consciousness of it's getting better and better and better and better and better. And it was always completely good. God is not wanting you to be rich by having more of a bank account. For those of us facing retirement, you may have come to the question, how much do I need? There is no number. There is no bank account that can measure real wealth. Real wealth is invisible. True prosperity is invisible. Jesus said, I'm come that they may have life and that they might have it more abundantly. This is what we are being given. And our job is to receive it. I've often felt that the most difficult part of loving is allowing yourself to be loved. When you understand that love is not something actually that you do, but that you allow, that love is the activity of the divine living as you, naturally, you don't have to do anything about it, you just have to allow it. Let it come, let it come through, because it comes in and it goes out like those old kitchen pumps. God doesn't want you to be rich. It wants you to live richly. I've come to think of it this way, and it came up in this morning's uh, treatment and meditation. God doesn't want you to be rich, but to be completely at home in the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. You know, I don't know what your home is like, but you all can imagine the ideal home. In that ideal home, you are eagerly welcomed whenever you arrive. You are loved. You are accepted. You are delighted in that image of coming home is a powerful, powerful image. It's a divine image. It's the prodigal son returning and finding that he is not only welcomed, but sought after. When we know 
who and what we are. This is what we experience. This is not just true of science of mind. This is true of Buddhism. This is true of Christianity. It is true of Islam. But I don't know if I'm at home if I don't recognize it. Actually, in this tradition, uh, when uh, metaphysics was really back in the start of the previous century, previous one, um, everybody used to sing this song, Open My Eyes That I May See. Open My Eyes That I May See. So we're back to this opening up this front gate. Let me see what's really here. And it turns out that what's really here cannot be seen with the physical eyes alone. I just reported on the brain studies. The brain studies show that your attitude of mind is the same as closing your eyes if you have an attitude which is shutting things out. Simply, by the way, it just means that you don't expect to see it. Some of you are now, no doubt, have seen a wonderful video which I will not tell to you because I want you to experience it. But to put it simply, it's possible for a gorilla to walk through the room and you won't see it. It's possible for God to walk through this room and you won't see it. This talk today is about what's happening in this room right now. This talk today is about what's happening in your mind right now, that one that is listening right here, the one that has no age, the one who knows what love is, who feels peace, who expands in joy. That's what you are. That's the nature of who you are. And if you look at your image in a mirror, if you look at other people and see their faces and do not see their hearts, do not see the one in every one, then you have shut your eyes. So we have to begin to open to that there's something that just our eyes alone won't show us, that there's something real that is invisible, if you will. And we have to begin to trust it. I'm reminded of when I was a teenager discovering my mother had this wonderful talent. Her talent was that she could float for hours at a time and read a book. <laughs> nice talent, Mom. I never knew you knew that. Have you ever tried to float? You know, you can't, most people can't just go float. You have to learn how to float. You have to know that the water will, in fact, support you. You have to know that first. So that you can relax enough for it to support you completely. This is our task to relax enough so that we can be completely supported by this invisible principle, like the fact that water is buoyant and it floats, that which is lighter than it. If you don't know about this internal principle, about the principle of water, you'll just thrash around and you'll prove to yourself water can't support anything. We all have that kind of proof in our life. So we don't look for a bank account to tell us that we're in heaven. We begin to trust some invisible principle. For instance, if a bank account were the way to know you were in heaven, we're ignoring a principle that the Japanese discovered, which is called just-in-time delivery. 
they had a big problem. They had all these cars to build. You no doubt have seen them out here. And the problem was they were having to warehouse everything. And they said, wait, wait, why are we doing this? Let's tell our suppliers that on the morning that we're going to build these 50 uh, Corollas, we want the fenders for them to arrive that morning. It's called just-in-time delivery. They eliminated the warehousing industry, and they put together this system called just-in-time. That's how God works. When you need it, it arrives. You may have thought you needed it some other time, but God knows, reality knows. And it doesn't stockpile all of those fenders for you for the day you'll need them. It delivers it when you need it. And God, reality, doesn't deliver it the same way all the time. So if you used to get it from over here, through this person, through this means, Spirit is constantly devising new means, new people to supply you. We think that we earn our income, but our income always comes from this awareness. This awareness that God is alive in everything and everyone. So you could say that our job is to be at home everywhere. I was uh, visiting the town of Las Vegas, New Mexico, which is not Las Vegas, Nevada. It's, it's a base of the Southern Rockies. And I walked into a store and she said, oh, you're lost. And I quickly said, I'm not lost, I'm just finding my way. I'm never lost. Because God is always wherever I am, always within me, always all around me. I've just forgotten. So I want to begin to develop my attention and my awareness to learn how to float on this reality, to let God tell me where I am, who I am, what's happening. To learn to rely on this reality, this universe, where I'm at home and knowing that all my needs will be supplied exactly when I need it. I need to develop that awareness. I'm about to teach a class on Taoism, Chinese ancient spiritual practice. Many people feel that they've discovered uh, spirituality when they step outside of Christianity. They find Taoism. Taoism is an amazing teaching. But it has an image of how we should be in the world that I want to give to you right now. It says that our relationship to the Tao, which is reality itself, our word that I've been used, God for, or spirit, is that we are to be like a child falling asleep with its head on its mother's shoulder. That is how we are to be in the world. Resting our head against the shoulder of the divine. We are being asked in, to move into a conscious, continuous dialogue interaction with that larger reality, which is, in fact, the one that we are. So I'd like to give you a sense of a practice that may give you an idea of how to inspire that awareness. So I'd suggest I'm drawing this from Sufism which is the mystical aspect of uh, Islam. And they do something called uh, zikr, 
which is the practice of remembering. And remembering, by the way, is not about the past, what happened there, but feeling what is already here, remembering what's here right now. So I'm going to ask you to, with your eyes open or closed, just allow yourself to imagine uh, the answer to these statements, the feeling of this. So stop and feel what it would feel like if you knew, actually knew, I have everything I need. If you actually knew, everything is taken care of. If you actually knew, God is always right here, right now. And if you knew and felt that I am willing to be a new being, something that I have never known of myself before. To experience that ever-expanding good called the kingdom of heaven. When you allow yourself to just touch into these feelings, you are tasting home. You are tasting the truth of your being. You are knowing the kingdom. You are experiencing it right now. And so, if I may, I'll end with a treatment. There is only one person here. There is only God. God is a name for the rest of us, each one of us, that we have not yet claimed as our being. It is always right where we are. We are always the center of it. This one consciously and deliberately in every moment chooses to be each person here in this room. It does so because it delights in being each one of us here. It finds the complete expression of its being, its wholeness, its perfection, alive as each person here. In this awareness, I accept for each one here the reality of what they are, presenting itself unmistakably, moment by moment, with increasing clarity from this moment on. And that each person here can no longer rely on the understanding of being an isolated, separated person who can be given to or taken away from. We begin to understand what we are. We are the life of that one. It is alive, and it knows its life as you. What a joy it is to know this truth. What a joy it is to feel the promise of what is here. What a joy it is to release any idea of having to do anything to bring it in. All we do is simply allow. So, with great gratitude for this awareness, I just release this word, knowing that it is an activity of the one itself, knowing itself, and that nothing can stand in the way. And I simply affirm this by saying, and so it is. Very pleased to introduce Dr. Kim talking to us this morning. And I got it all set up for you, almost. Almost, there we go. Thank you, Thank you very much.
Well, I feel very welcomed here. I came yesterday just to check out the place and I discovered the labyrinth and all of this wonderful property. Uh, this community is a real, what I call a hidden treasure because I didn't know about you until today. Um, I, I came, as I say, uh, yesterday and I went to the uh, uh, the wine tasting and the uh, food thing going downtown. I have to be nearby, and it was quite an event. Uh, just all those people around, I got the chance to feel what Reading might be like. But have you ever been somewhere like that where someone is calling out a name, you know, and you're not sure, uh, but it turns out to be you that they're calling for? So I felt like that yesterday when I received this statement with the question attached. This is the question, what will you be looking for? And this was the statement I received. Today is a pristine day, unfolding from the mind of God without impediment, unencumbered by the past. Watch for it and nothing else. And so we begin this service further stepping into that awareness. I'm here, uh, I just want you to know that I'm here uh, also to talk to anyone who's interested in ministerial school. I'll be meeting with people after this service. And there's no commitment, of course, but that understanding of being called and not quite recognizing that it's your name that's being called. Uh, this is the territory, I think, of spirituality. That kind of recognition, I, I, I experienced a call when about, well, it must be eight years ago, uh, I saw what was then still in publishing uh, Time magazine, and it had the title, uh, Does God Want You to Be Rich? I said, I cannot pass this up. Uh, it was just like, oh, so obvious. Okay, all right. So as you may know, many of the Christian denominations are now having this conversation. And um, people like Joel Osteen or Joyce Meyer are examples of a Christian teaching, which often sounds like science of mind, like our teaching, except that they use um, other aids, such as the devil, that we don't particularly um, <laughs> use. Okay, so... What happens when this is discussed, in, and I don't want to characterize any one church, but in Christian churches often is that there's an implication here that God is somehow outside of you, and that God is either going to give you or take away something that you have or don't have. In other words, as they say, God changes up on you. <laughs> so when you get this going on, you've got an external God who kind of gives arbitrarily or not, uh, and who wants things for you, but could withhold it. Then you've got, um, you know, this big question, what does God really want for you? And the other thing that, that that question implies is that God really likes it if you have a difficult time. <laughs> In fact, you know, we're taught to value ourselves by how much difficulty we have. How courageous am I? What kind of virtue is going on in me? Basically, we look at things like suffering and challenges, and we say, well, there's got to be a value here somewhere. And by the way, preparing for this talk, I turned on. I listened to um, church radio. I just love to hear what people are saying, OK? And I happened to turn into two different uh, preachers in the midst of explaining in detail why God wants you to suffer. <laughs> so it's, it's really built into this understanding that somehow some part of you is going to emerge because you suffer. That the real you won't arrive until you completely have done your suffering. <laughs> okay, so... As you may guess, by the way, I'm talking about this. This is not our approach. <laughs> um, it basically shows that 
asking a question like, does God want you to be rich, is really basically uh, an issue of asking the wrong question. Uh, by the way, I'll give you the answer. Does God want you to be rich? The answer is no. Okay. Stay listening. <laughs> okay, why is it no? Okay, here we go. All right, God isn't out there, as I've said. Where God is, is that which in you right now is hearing this word. Pay attention to the place right now that is hearing this word and understanding it. That is the one mind. It is the same mind in all of us. It knows uniquely in each of us, but it is the same mind that is knowing. It is always where you are. It is here right now. Spiritual practice is about understanding that it is happening right now. Not later. Not when you decide to do this or stop doing that. It's happening right now. And the most direct route to it is by turning within. As Ernest Holmes, our founder, said in what we believe, he said, the innermost God and the highest God are the same. It's possible, though, to think, well, God's in me, but, you know, there's a lot of other stuff in me, too. As one of my friends used to say, he said, God is not like some small part of us, like a raisin in a bun. <laughs> that somehow there's, a, there, there's God stuff in me, but there's all that other dough <laughs> that I've got to get rid of, you know? So our teaching says something that is really hard to take in because it doesn't really exclude anything. Therefore, it's hard to distinguish. But understand this. God is all there is. God is all there is to you. That's always been true. It's true right now. God is all there is, including all of you and everything around you. It doesn't do anything to you from the outside. It cannot do that. As you heard in the reading, we are one. Nothing can separate us. So God doesn't do something to you. God acts through you. And even more than that, when God is acting, it looks like you. You are God acting, whether you know it or not. The more you know it, the more you let it through into consciousness, the more you feel completely what you already are. God can't give anything more because all of it is already here right now. God is here right now in this room, in you in me, between us. Everything that you have ever wanted God to be, that your heart has said God must be, is here now. But we don't perceive it. We don't perceive it because there are, as uh, some traditions say, the five gates. In Zen Buddhism, they say this, that which comes in through the front gate is not the treasure. The five gates are your senses. The five gates are what you see, hear, feel, taste, touch. And as long as you rely on the senses for your total and complete proof of what is real, 
you are going to get a distorted experience of what is real because what is happening now in brain science, if you're reading about this stuff, cognitive neuroscience, it's saying your very perceptions, what you see, what you hear, what you smell, what you taste, are formed by what you expect to see, hear, feel, taste. This is not like you put some filter over it, your actual brain changes and you perceive differently. So it turns out that you can't perceive without having some understanding of what you're perceiving. And that's what spiritual practice is, is to take this understanding that God is all there is to you and it open it up so that you are perceiving it in every moment, in everything, in every encounter. God doesn't want you to receive something to make you better than before. God wants you to begin to rest in what you are. To let yourself feel that which is, in fact, supporting you right now, where you are right now. What God wants to give you is the kingdom it's called the kingdom of heaven in Christianity. And the phrase from Luke goes like this, Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Reality, God, it, is attempting right now to give you all that it is. That is, to open your awareness to all that you are. And let me be clear, God or spirit, whatever, is a name for the rest of you that you have not yet claimed as your own being. There is no God out there. There is a God that you are the face of. There's a wonderful image of this, by the way, and since the choir is saying you are the face of God to the children, the wonderful image, think of an infinite diamond, infinitely large. And it has a whole infinite number of faces. You know how the uh, diamond cutter cuts a face. This diamond is reality. And there's an infinite number of faces, and you and I are the faces. Think about it. Look at any one face. What is its body? the whole diamond. If you want to see the whole diamond, you look into a face. If you want to get from one face to another, do you look outside? No, you look inside. We are living right now in the midst of what has been called the kingdom of heaven, we are, each of us, the open door to all that it is. And spiritual practice is to bring that into our awareness, into our understanding, so we can open our perceptions to what is here already. Because everything we want is here already. A standard song used to be sung in this movement for years and years was, Open my eyes that I may see. We have practices to do that. We do treatment, which is our form of prayer. But what that is, is aligning you with what is here. So you don't stop looking for something somewhere else or not seeing what is here. We're in the kingdom of heaven. And another way of talking about the kingdom of heaven is it's a consciousness, a state of consciousness in which good is ever expanding. It's never incomplete. It's always complete. And it's always expanding. So heaven is an awareness of this expanding good. And it is both visible and invisible good, for instance, what good would you have for yourself in your heart right now? 
Would you like to know and feel the love that God has for you? Would you like to have that and know that feeling? That's the gift that God wants to give. God doesn't want you to have more in your bank account. A bank account can never measure real wealth. The real wealth we're talking about is happening when you begin to allow that not only does God love you, but in fact, you love you. We have been taught not to love ourselves. We have been taught to doubt ourselves. We have been taught that a responsible person struggles to finally come to some understanding where they are able to endure with grace. That's not our teaching. We're not here to endure. We're here to expand the consciousness of good, to participate in that which is going on all the time anyway. Open my eyes that I may see. So we have to develop a, an ability to pay attention to something which is not immediately visible, but is in fact part of the very structure of reality itself. I discovered later in my life one of the remarkable talents, later in my teenage life, uh, one of the remarkable talents my mother had. My mother was able to float in a lake for hours at a time while reading a book. <laughs> wow, Mom, I didn't know. But you know, if you don't know that water is buoyant, if you don't know that water can support you, then you won't float. You have to teach yourself to float, and you have to teach yourself to float based on your understanding that water will support me. And you have to teach yourself to float by learning to relax into it. Our learning is to let go. Our learning is to allow. Our learning is to rest in the divine. I'm about to teach a course at, uh, the, in Santa Rosa on the Taoism. And I'm fascinated as I study Taoism more deeply. But one of the things it says, one of the wonderful images that it brings is this, that uh, it says, we are to be in relationship to reality, the Tao, by the way, that's what the Tao means. Like a child being held in its mother's arms, resting its head against her shoulder. That is the image that Taoism speaks of. This is what we are being called into. And you know, we can no longer use things like uh, the bank account to tell us what God is doing. I always loved when I first learned about the Japanese, uh, must have been 70s or 80s, uh, they were uh, having problems with the Japanese with all those autos that were driving around, you know. They, um, they, they had a problem with warehousing all the parts, getting them ready for the, the manufacturing. And they discovered something where if they just said, okay, we're building 50 Toyota Corollas today, send us 50 fenders today when we need them just in time. That's how God works. God works, it arrives when you need it. It arrives just when you need it, just how you need it. You know, we keep thinking that we know how we're going to get our income. We know where it's going to come from. But God is not bound by anything. God is not bound by you having to work for it. 
we have to look for it, not just work for it. God can bring you your good from anywhere. And if you begin to allow it and to expect it, then it will, as Michael Beckwith loves to say, track you down. So we're always looking to find that place of rest, that place of home, wherever we are, the kingdom. I was in uh, Las Vegas, Mexico, New Mexico, not Nevada. Been there too, but this was Las Vegas, New Mexico, and I was wandering through this uh, old town, and I walked into a store, and they said, oh, you're lost. And I said, no, I'm not lost. I'm just finding my way. I'm never lost. You're never lost because God is always right where I am. Always within and around me. I've just forgotten. We're learning how to rest on that invisible structure like the structure of water itself that supports you completely when you know how to allow it to. We are here to move into a relationship to the one where we are forgetting everything that we have said we are and allow it to tell us what we are. We move into a dialogue with reality. We're receiving constant communication and confirmation from it. We have to learn to live the way this wonderful poem from Hafez, and we just discussed this is actually an elaboration of Hafez, but I love it because he's got such a humor, and the translator does. The name of the poem is, uh, We Might Have to Medicate You. <laughs> it goes like this. Resist your temptation to lie by speaking of separation from God. Otherwise, we might have to medicate you. <laughs> In the ocean, a lot goes on beneath your eyes. Listen, they have clinics there, too, for the insane who persist in saying things like, I am independent from the sea. God is not always around, gently pressing against my body. That's the reality of our life. That's what we are being called into the full participation and knowing of. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So I want to close with a brief practice which is, um, comes from Sufism, the mystical form of Islam. And they talk about their main practice as zikr or remembering. And remembering isn't about what happened before. Remembering is what's here now, feeling it. So what I'd like you to do is to invoke the presence, the awareness of the presence by just either with your eyes closed or just sitting there. Just taste what it would be like if the following statements were actually true. I have everything I need.
everything is taken care of. God is always right here. I'm willing to be new. When you are allowing yourself to taste or touch that, you are feeling and living the kingdom. You're experiencing it right now. Our practice of prayer, our practice of study, our practice of community is meant to place us where we are continually surrounded by the awareness that God is what surrounds us, that God is what's within us. And so I'll end this talk with a treatment. Right here, right now, God is. Only God is. God is what our hearts have been calling for. God is love. God is peace. God is joy. It's here right now. It's knowing and understanding in each one here right now. This is the truth of our being. This is what's going on. So I speak this word for everyone here by allowing that it is the truth that God is the only one here and I accept for each one that it is no longer possible to mistake oneself and imagine that you are living alone and separate that the truth of who we are begins to expand within our awareness in such ways that every issue that we face, every challenge that comes forth, we begin to understand it is the movement of the Divine One asking to be known again in a new way. And we rest in this awareness and we return to it again and again. And we allow ourselves to feel that which is indeed pressing against us. I am so grateful to know that this is the truth of what we are, of what's really going on. And in this awareness, I release this word knowing that it is, in fact, the one itself knowing and loving its word. So I just let it be, and so it is.